Yo, it's Guido coming at you with the Tactics Talk, guys. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of World of Tanks. We've got Pirani in his Barask Tier 8 French. This is as close to a wheeled tank as a tracked tank gets. It really is built kind of on the, the model of the wheeled tanks. Interesting, it's a Tier 8 and it runs around with a 360 Alpha gun, but it's only got two shells, though the reload is pretty quick. Pirani's going to make pretty good use of the reload in here. We are on airfield, spawned into the east side of airfield and we're going to go ahead and play around on the hill. So on this one, Pirani uh, said, hey, we pulled it out at the end. We're going to take a look at that because uh, I'm always curious when people say we pulled it out at the end or it was a close one. What happened before that? How did it get to that point? And after watching this one, it was kind of interesting. And I think there's a couple things we can talk about here. Using mobility on this map is very difficult unless you last to the end of the game. And even then, it's not very easy. It's at one of the more open channelized maps. And the reason is it's got this really high terrain in the middle of this position here and then slightly to the north of it where the heavies fight. And it's very difficult to get into the other side of the map at all without being seen. And the south is full of water. The north is full of, of mountains. And you just, you know, so much of the map is unusable. That guy got away, got away from you a little bit right there. It looked like you struggled a bit to get the uh, auto aim going. Uh, a six by six, I don't know why that guy's doing that. There, there's literally no reason to do that, but he may be one of those things where it's a frustration with a mobile tank, and he doesn't have much else to do. There's no arty to go, to go hunt, and maybe he got a little bit of a light back there. But because this ground is so high right here, nobody really has any shots on anyone in the backfield other than people who are up there like the Centurion. And we're going to watch the Centurion 1 because he's not very skilled. You can tell by the way he's playing. Also, Pirani's team is not helping much. Look how many of them are back. <laughs> he has a Centurion back there. He has a Scorpion, which is not surprising, and a JPZ. But there's also a 5100. And then there's something else right next to the Centurion right there. Maybe it's the 6x6 that's so run back, does he? Yeah, there's two 6x6s, and one of them's camping in the back. And even the prototype, who's actually a pretty good heavy for this match because it's all a tier 8 battle, is in the back. So Prani's not got a whole lot to work with. The Centurion eventually starts to take damage. Looks like we're running two kits here. we got a large kit and a small kit and a large, as far as repair kit goes, and we've got a large first aid kit. And we're just going to kind of peek and poke. There's no artillery, so what the Centurion and Prani are doing here would be very dangerous with artillery. You really would not want to stay that stagnant for that long. Centurion takes a hit, and what I want you to start thinking about Prani, once you see that Centurion get close to a two-shot, he's not quite there for you. I don't think you can even really high roll, but now, all right, so once that happens, it's time to start thinking about how I remove that guy. And this goes back to a, a, a pretty passive game style that you've got, play style, at least on this, this game. And when, I, when I'm starting to think about how to leverage an advantage, these are the kind of things I immediately notice. I... I go, okay, how do I get rid of this Centurion? I'd really like to get rid of him. He will no longer be lighting me. Then I can start doing pokes over this ridge and maybe find guys back there to shoot. Right now, if I poke over this ridge, whatever's back there is going to know I'm coming from a mile away. And my team is starting to create an advantage. So how do I create an advantage that leverages my team's three kill advantage, which are all happen to be light tanks, so it's not a great advantage right now on this map. There's still a lot of TD that, that can start taking guys down. And you'd have to look at the overall hit points as to whether it cost us a lot to get those three. But you get the general idea that I'm starting to think about how do I leverage the advantage my team's creating by helping them creating an advantage in my local area, which will then help to snowball the rest of the advantages. And for me right now, Prani, I would get rid of the Centurion. That's what a little autoloader like this is for. So we're going to go ahead. And he's not really paying attention. right? He's not really paying attention to me. I would get up and over and take him down. Yes, there are other guys. All right. The Centurion, which is why I brought this up, just fired. So you've got a good six, seven seconds before the Centurion can fire again. There may be another TD back there. But I think right now, you come up and over and you shoot that Centurion twice and you get rid of that guy right now. And then we start working on the rest of the guys. Well, what happens is... We just sit here, and uh, as a matter of fact, we're on a reload. Looks like we've decided to go to HE. So our decision to get rid of the Centurion was to go to HE. Okay, so taking a little bit of a longer, a little bit of a longer view on it, and now we've got this guy down to one shot. So all I got to do in here is get in here and get that HE shot on him. So we'll come in here and, uh oh, that's not enough, and we take a hit, and we miss. 
<laughs> so you really needed to get rid of that guy. And all of a sudden the T28 prototype is here and now I have many fewer options and I failed to get rid of the Centurion. Now the RPZ has moved up. We're messing around with him. I would have slid down low, down to here, not come around the corner, and just make sure I was ready to take that guy on. As soon as I went, as soon as I reloaded, get down there and pop him twice. Boom. They just got tracked. That was your opportunity. He's tracked. He's looking at them. You could have popped around. Even if you took a hit, you were going to hammer him twice. Maybe even kill him. Probably kill him based on your damage that you've got. And if not, you're hitting him twice in the side and tracking him and these guys get rid of him. So again, another opportunity for a second guy to get rid of. And oh, by the way, we forget that there's a prototype and we take a hit. So now we've given up a bunch of hit points. We've killed none of the guys in our local area right here. And I really think you could have had two of them gone. The prototype decides to try to make a change on this side and he takes some hits doing it. We actually don't get a kill trying to get up under the lower plate right there. And finally get the prototype who basically lost his mind. Now we've got a, a still have a pretty good advantage. We're f up four to one. Trying to get a reload and we really want to get rid of this guy. So we're just sort of sitting here rocking back and forth. We know there's a charioteer back there. And then we lose a guy. Now it's 4-2. Not as big of an advantage. And then we go, well, I don't okay, we'll wander around this way. So instead of trying to figure out a way to get rid of the Centurion, we change the fight a little bit. I don't can anyone actually get in this bush? You shoot this bush twice. I someone someone tell me. I don't know. I don't know if that bush is actually able to be got into. Maybe it is. I think the, and I will prove it in just a minute, the charioteer is actually on the lower level. Peeking around the corner right there. Centurion is still alive with his 10 hit points. And we're down here shooting into bushes. So this is kind of my point on prioritization. The Centurion needs to be got rid of first before we start messing around with the charioteer. We just really need to get rid of that guy. And he makes a runner. And we're back into a reload. We're up 6-2. This looks like we're in really good shape. But this game gets very, very interesting pretty quickly here. So we're just about reloaded. We know the charioteers move. We're kind of come around here. It looks like we're looking for an opportunity to shoot the Centurion, and he ends up dying. Now we're going to push across. We know there's a Su-130 back here. So we come across. I mean, I might have just stopped right here. Maybe even a little bit closer to this cover and what and zoomed in and tried to take a shot. Now he's going to swing his gun on you pretty quickly, but you might have got a shot right here but we kind of go past and then we come up high and I don't know really what this maneuver was to be honest because I think you had a shot but you were looking in the third person we're watching what he's doing he's kind of paying attention somewhere else I don't I still don't think his gun is on you I don't think he actually knows you're there and we really kind of let that go he knew you were there the LTTB but he ends up getting killed now we're gonna push in and we know that there's a charioteer somewhere and I'm kind of like, all right, so, you know, what's the plan here? We don't have enough, we don't have enough firepower to take on the Su-130. So we're just sort of sitting here. We lose some guys. All of a sudden, it's 9 to 5. 9 to 6. 6 by 6 pushes in. We push in. But instead of going over here and trying to help and make sure we get rid of the 130, we come around this way. The Baroska actually dies. The 6 by 6 died. And guess who's still alive? Actually, yeah, the the, <laughs> the 130 is still alive. Now, you might have had trouble pushing in there, but the point is a bunch of guys push in, and you're just still on the periphery. We've we got 372 damage, 1,225 assist. And it's been pretty passive and reactionary overall. We're going to finally get in here. We get up behind the charioteer. We're going to be able to do some damage to him. The good news is we've got the T-54 Mod 1. We shoot him. We shoot them and we ram them, which I would not have done at this point in the game. You needed those hit points. There was no reason to give up the 176 for the ram right there. I think you were going to get that guy anyway based on the T-54 Mod 1. Should have taken your two shots and ran off instead of ramming them. You may have thought... I was very surprised you actually made it up this. That's pretty amazing. Boom, there it goes. And all of a sudden, it's 12 to 9. And the 152 is actually have pretty good hit points. Plus, there's a WZ. I want to say that's rough. Yeah, he's 100%. 
So we're going to cross here. This is where the Barosk and light tanks start to shine in their mobility, like I talked about at the very beginning. The map is hard to use mobility until you get to this point in the game, and then you can start flying around the map and moving around. So we're going to come here, and we're going to come around this corner. If I'm going to come around this corner and I think somebody might be up in one of these spots, I'm going to be ready aimed it to shoot, as opposed to this third person thing. So we're just kind of looking. Where did the 152 go? The Bulldog and Scorpion are headed up to the cap. They find the WZ. There's three on one down there, right? Three on one. WZ is trying to take these guys on. We are over here looking for the ISU. So, instead of going to try to light guys that are dark, why not go with your guns over there? Boom, there goes the Kanonen. Remember a WZ-120 reloads pretty quickly. The Bulldog and the Scorpion are trying to get in there on him. T-54 Mod 1 is locked in place. The prototype's not moving. There goes the Bulldog. And you're not able to find the 152s. Why? Because they have gone to help their buddy. Scorpion is now dead. And all of a sudden, holy cow, it's 12 to 12. And we're just back here wandering around trying to find some 152s. Gonna go over this way. I think you would have done a lot better headed over to Cap to force them to come to Cap because they were gonna have a hard time as casemates doing so. Now you've got an opportunity because there they are. So we're gonna come over here. A hit goes into that guy. That's good. We've softened him up, softened him up a little bit. Come around the corner and we find him. Now you went way too far. There was no reason to drive that far out into the open. I would have absolutely been down here. Take the shot unfortunate a real big low roll that really sucked and we get him dead that's fine so we'll back out of there you've been spotted the other buddy comes around wz's low hit points he hammers the t54 mod one unfortunately i would have absolutely gone to apcr here the game is in the balance this is what hoarding your apcr uh, gold both rounds are apcr but this is what hoarding your gold is for Get a shot into him. Things are looking a little up. That's good. And, dude, it's time to push. You should have hit C. As soon as he went around the corner and your mod 1 was getting in there to get engaged, should have hit C and pressed into the advantage. And this is kind of what I'm seeing for this whole replay is a, a slight hesitation on when to push in and get in there and start working on these guys. So we're going to come in. The WZ is clearly coming at the, at the mod 1. What are your advantages with 2v1? With the Mod 1 and you and the WZ at basically a one-shot, it's that he has to pick one. But what we do is we cut left, take ourselves out of the fight. I would have gone straight at the guy. Just go straight at him. That's your advantage. One of you is going to die. The other one should be able to kill him. But as it is, you don't get either one of you, either, either one of you taken care of. We actually take a hit right there. And luck out, right? That was a heat shell that looks like it hit either a weird angle or the track. And we survived that. Whereas had you gone straight at him, you'd have had two shots to take him down. And now we're bumming because we're 1v2. we got to figure out how to take on these two casemates. I like this. This is moving in a different direction. They're not really expecting. They sort of saw you go that way, but you're going to be actually pretty careful about what you do. Go all the way around. I would not have jumped that. You're, I'll be honest, you're lucky you didn't take more damage or even kill yourself on that. Just a little bit more nose down and you probably take yourself out of the game. But I'm imagining you wanted to get over that as fast as possible and not get shot. The WZ is not too, a slouch really. It's got decent speed for a casemate. The 152K is pretty slow. So we'll come up and around. I think this is good to be careful. And then you're going to come up onto this ramp area, which I think is a good idea. I don't know if you guys have been watching, but down in the chat there's a, a, some uh, recriminations and whatnot. Hate and recriminations being thrown around. People are not happy. This was a easily won game that has been almost thrown away. And I think if we watched other people's gameplay, we'd see a lot of what Pirani's in. Alright, we find one. We know we only have a little bit of time. We've got to get rid of this guy. So we're going to come up here, look around a little bit. And we've wasted a bunch of time trying. I think I would have just driven right off the, if I can get this to do this. I'd have gone right off these rocks, just 
quickly, but not but not like jumping them and just got around behind this guy. He doesn't turn very fast. You had him basically right here is what I'm saying. Maybe take that shot. Ooh, you just about had it on there. And holy cow, there's this guy. And he misses. Can you believe that he misses? He goes for the ram, puts some good damage on you, and you're able to kill him. <laughs> and then we head off. And we're going to watch. This guy is just about to turn around and get his gun on you. And now he is pushing up onto the ramp. We're going to come around here. We do a nice job of going down that little divot. And we survive and get reloaded. That was nicely done. Then we turn on the, the brakes and head off this way. And now we're going to go try to find the 152 and duel him. Going around this way, just trying to maybe use these bushes a little bit, see if we can see him first. Goodness knows where he is. Probably not too far away. Is he up here? No, he's not there. This provides us an opportunity to proxy light him without him, unless he's right on top of this little hill right here staring right down the ramp you're coming up you have an opportunity to proxy light them down in the village down there the ability to get hold down if need be they're still arguing over there and there he is all right so we find the guy and holy cow he's not pointed towards us so we'll come down boom and look at that not we leave him with two hit points uh, that's a bummer does he come up he doesn't know he knows you have another shell and we're just going to turn around and go away. This time we load HE. I think that's probably a good idea. More than likely you're going to do two hit points with HE no matter what you hit. Theoretically. Nice little nice little turnaround right there. It looked like you were going away. He was kind of coming up the hill. Maybe slightly dangerous. If he'd, if he'd been able to top right there, he might have caught you crossing. But a little bit surprised that he's not sort of sitting here waiting. He doesn't have a lot of options, so he's going to try to get back into the corner here. We're looking to proxy light him. There he is. This surprised me. I, I didn't know whether he was pointing at me or not. I think I would have zoomed out. It's hard for me to get my camera to do it. And try to find where his, where his gun is pointed. But it doesn't look like you did. You just come in and find him and kill him. <laughs> and holy cow. Three kills. 2,379 damage. 1,225. That took a long time. Man, there were all kinds of little things we could have done better in there. And that's what I talked about. At the very beginning, when I get somebody says, hey, we pulled it out in the end, I'm always kind of curious, all right, well, how, how did we kind of get there? What, why did we need to pull it out at the end? And I think it really starts with leveraging a little bit more of this thing's mobility, being able to take out threats methodically, the ones that are most important. Getting rid of that Centurion was, was probably the first step. Then back down to the RPZ, helping out a little bit more with that guy. Uh, faster shots into the Su-130. By the way, had you hit that Su-130 once or twice, that T-54 Mod 1 would have had a much easier time taking him down, as would it have the 6x6 and I think your other Barask. So you can see how your decisions actually impact the rest of the team's gameplay. Things you don't do, damage you don't, you don't deliver, tanks you don't take out fast enough have an opportunity to shoot and take hit points away from the rest of your team. And that that game was quickly becoming a cascading romple stomp, but because of the very passive and timid play, careful play, I guess, let's call it that, careful play by quite a few players on the team, it just sort of let the, the other team slowly grind back into the game. Now it's tricky because you don't want to just YOLO in and die. At the same time, you got to be careful about a slow grinding game against high alpha TDs because in this case they nearly came back and took you guys out right there so like I said there's multiple opportunities there that I mentioned where I think if you'd have been a little more aggressive a little bit more aware of what was going on you might have been able to put a few more shots down range taken out a few more guns as you went and made that end game a little bit easier all right man I hope that helped that's all I've got for today thanks for tuning in guys and we will see you